Speaking not. <laughs> well, ask him to speak up. You must speak up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gentlemen, gentlemen, you must forgive me. You see before you someone who feels it incumbent upon himself to hoard such pitiful remnants of his bodily strength as he still possesses. <laughs> Indeed. Even as I begin. I am already overcome by anxiety, lest I should be unable to conclude. You shared my experience. I'll wager that you too would now be unbalanced. All of you. The dreadful misfortune of my life began over 30 years ago while I was visiting the free port of Hamburg. Then as now a city of beauty and energy. Although its heart and soul had been ravaged by the great fire of 1842. As the younger son of an established Norwich coach builder, I had been sent to Hamburg by my father to negotiate the construction and sale of those canary yellow carriages which the leading burghers had found to be ideally suited as public conveyances. My host was the venerable senator Otto Steckerbeck, an old friend of my father's. All the members of his charming family were courtesy itself, always, for instance, choosing to speak English in my presence, and in all manners of ways contriving to make the stranger feel welcome in their house. This was one of those characteristic old merchants' houses built along the narrow canals which link the River Elbe with that magnificent lake, the Alst. During the day, my hosts would show me the sights of the city. Then in the evenings, we would all sit together around the stove, and by the glow of candle and fire, beguile one another with fearful ghost stories. Nor had it escaped my observation, gentlemen, that my father's intent in sending me to Hamburg may not have been solely the interests of the family business. For I was 35 and still a bachelor, and I suspect that my father and Herr Steckerbeck hoped to connect me with Frau Steckerbeck's widowed cousin, Elise. Her wealthy husband, a shipbuilder, had perished in the Great Fire before poor Elise had even reached the tender age of 20. Oh, gentlemen, <laughs> the passionate glances that would pass on those flickering nights between that lady herself, so long deprived of conjugal joy and the no longer young bachelor who had never tasted them at all. Myself, 
Thus we sat, with the Stakebecks usually imbibing mulled wine. I chose, as always, to abstain. It will be in vain to follow, for I shall learn no more of him nor of his deeds. <sighs> Very good. Very good. It is an English writer? Oh, no, madam, American. American? Oh. <laughs> A red Indian. Oh, felicitas. Tomorrow, Herr Nightingale, it will be your turn. Oh, but I'm afraid I know nothing suitable. Oh. Frau Stekebeck, I am not versed. Then I shall lend you one of these. Let me see. Uh. I, I have in my room many English books. I am ready for my bed. Oh, yes, we should all like to retire for the night oh, now. Yes, I have the need. Oh, I have seen so much of your beautiful city today, Frau Stekerberg. <laughs> then you must go to bed, Herr Nightingale. My hosts had once again amused themselves, unaware that their monstrous stories of ghosts and vampires had chilled me to the bone. Ever since my poor mother's untimely death, two obsessive fears haunted my life. The fear of loving and the fear of dying. How long before my spirit would succumb, crushed between these two monstrous pillars of dread. I knew that I could never hope to come to terms with the one fear unless I vanquished the other. In that house, in the alien city of Hamburg, I now dimly perceived my last chance to conquer the horror once and for all, lest it conquered me. From the moment I crossed the threshold at night, this room, with its strange shapes and flickering shadows, filled me with cunning, devious, inexplicable terror and dread. I felt that I was never once alone in that room, that I was being watched, perhaps guarded or protected, possibly even menaced, but by whom? night, every day, oh, sleepless night, outside the window, I thought I glimpsed seagulls mewing and diving, seagulls at night, black seagulls. Good morning, Fraulein Felicitas. It is true, Herr Nightingale, you eat fish for breakfast in England. It is not uncommon, sir. Only for breakfast? No, sometimes for lunch and too. In some houses, on Fridays, usually. Ah, it is a religious practice. Well, in a manner of speaking, yes. Oh, 
Fish is also served for supper in England, surely? Yes, yes I have read that in Mr. Peep's book. <laughs> he is always supping on fish. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> then you eat fish for breakfast, luncheon, and then again for supper. Three times a day you have it. Oh, no, you have mistaken me, Fraulein Felicitas. I thought uh, that it is... No, it is most unusual to have fish more than once a day. In England. <laughs> most unusual. Then we shall have it for our luncheon today. Oh. Oh, thank you. Uh, fish. Place on the bone, Herr Nightingale, in your honour. Place. Fresh from the North Sea. It is a local speciality. Fresh from the sea and into the frying pan. How is this supposed to be the best fish in the world, <laughs> in Nightingale? An old fisherman brings it to me directly to the house. Right. It's still wet. The recipe for cooking the fish, it is the same as you have in England. Briefly, but quite unmistakably, I could that see the disappointment in Frau Elise's eyes. She had given me due consideration and had found me wanting. And then the little slices of bacon are served as a... on top of the fish, the uh, finished fish. A garnish, my dear, a uh, garnish. Uh, <laughs> how do you like it, a nightingale? What? No, I, I beg your pardon, I... How do you like your fish prepared? Perhaps Herr Nightingale does not care for fish. <laughs> I fear I am not over fond of fish. Indeed, no. If I'm being perfectly honest, I don't care for fish at all. Oh. Oh. Perhaps he feels sorry for our poor plates. One minute he is alive, swimming happily in the sea, and the next... Is it different for human beings? One cannot ever be sure. In the midst of life. Ah, yes. Oh. The fire. Our fire, Herr Nightingale. Yes, our fire. From one moment to the next. Death and extinction. Oh, yes, how true. I mean, one never can be sure of anything in this life. I mean, not even when one is going to die. <laughs> and yet, I must admit that... I've often thought how incredible, how marvellous it would be if one could know when. 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 When one will die, Herr Nightingale. Yes, thank you, yes. Uh, someone has just walked over your grave, yes? It was nothing, sir, nothing. Do you wish for a glass of water? You know, it really is a pity that I am not more fond of fish. It's a great pity indeed. The days passed. The Stekebecks became my friends. But at night, the secret solitary terrors seized me still. How I prayed and dreaded that Elise, or dare I admit it, even Felicitas would knock upon my door on some innocent pretext. Abominable thought. Was it for such speculations that my father had sent me here? Was this how I would conquer my fears? 
I determined to take a sleeping draught and to pray to my mother for grace. truth. I want the truth. The truth? <laughs> oh, no, please. Help me. <laughs> They're flying. Black seagulls. Because we have both decided, quite independently, not to go to evening service tonight, Frau Elise. I think once is quite enough, even on Sundays. At home, I attend Mass. On Sundays. You are not a Lutheran, Mr. Nightingale. Topelius is something strange also, a, a Danish sect. Um, Herr Topelius? Frau Stekebeck's father, who, who reads so well the ghost stories. But I thought I understood him to be Herr Stekebeck's father. Oh, no. But old Frau Stekebeck... Old Frau Stekebeck is Herr Stekebeck's mother, but Herr Topelius is Frau Stekebeck's father. It, <laughs> it, it is somewhat confusing, perhaps. Yeah. Well, then... They seem so much, so much like husband and wife. I thought... Oh, old Frau Stegebeck and Herr Topelius, oh, they would laugh to hear themselves so described. They are certainly not married to each other. They are widowed. As we are. Um, but Frau Elise, I am a bachelor. Yes, I, I uh, am... Single, try and say. Single. It is a good manner of living. Is it, Herr Nightingale?
He described his own condition as being quite beyond comprehension. The most terrible anguish now mingled with a ravishing delight he had never experienced before. Suddenly, he was in the midst of a brightness so dazzling that it blinded him. But on awakening, he still felt the anguished dread of his dream. He instantly rushed into her room. Her hands, as she lay on the divan, were devoutly folded. She looked as if sleeping peacefully, dreaming of the joys of heaven. But she was dead. A beautiful translation. But sad, so sad. Sad? What nonsense. I didn't believe a word. Felicitas. <laughs> Tonight, I hope I shall not dream. But such ghastly things do not happen in Hamburg, my dear. <laughs> I should hope not. Indeed, no. Yes, take it back. Yes? But I, might I have a few words with you, sir, in private? But of course. It is too nice. Please? Yes? I have some regrettable news from Norwich, sir. Mr. Nightingale. Well, to come to the point at once, we cannot now manufacture the vehicles that you require. Ah, you mean something untoward has occurred in Norwich? Oh, not in Norwich, sir. It would doubtless be more correct to discuss matters of commerce at my contour, Nightingale. Where are you, sir, are assisted by your own clerks and ledger keepers who offer you protection? Huh? Are you saying, uh, Nightingale? Are you saying there is some irregularity in our accounts? That I, a senator? Yes. Would ever act in an incorrect manner? Incorrect? Oh, sir. If I were not a guest in your house, I should express myself far more forcefully. <laughs> I see you are drinking our grog, Herr Nightingale. Are you perhaps uh, unwell? Well, I'm perfectly well, sir. And in spite of your vicious insinuations, sober. Which is not a condition to be found too frequently among the members of your household, sir. I trust you will feel well again in the morning, Herr Nightingale. When we will, of course, investigate this matter most thoroughly. At my contour. to find it. Find it? The truth. The date. The date of my death.
Is it that? The purpose. The purpose. Mm. Mm. Oh. Oh. Mm. Hello, did you Excuse me, but... Well, last night I... I heard such voices. Oh, forgive me. I, I know I should not be here, but... I must ask you, Herr Nightingale, is it in such a fashion that one repays the gift of hospitality in England? Don't come over there! Frau Steckerbeck, but one stand! <laughs> is my husband's house to you, Herr Nightingale? What have you made of it? Only if I have done anything to offend you, dear lady, anything to warrant your censure, I most humbly... <laughs> I beg your family's forgiveness. Nightingale. Did I imagine it? Did I hear you say you did not care for fish? I love fish. I like nothing better. It's so fresh, so firm, so flaky. Then I must be developing deafness or a faulty memory. Lit it us, bitter. Indeed? Indeed. For I heard you say quite distinctly on more than one occasion that you could not abide fish of any kind. Oh, I love fish. Of any kind. As I love life itself! <laughs> Her nightingale is not feeling very well, Felicitas. Oh. Then shall you not be visiting Papa at his contour tomorrow morning? Our business is concluded. Or, if I may presume, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Terminated. <laughs> Terminated! Herr Nightingale, I regret to say, will shortly be returning to England. What? I didn't know. I was not told. She was not told. What? So soon. And you have not even paid proper attention to our beautiful harbour. Oh, what neglect. But that will never do. I must see it. Your beautiful armor. Then do you wish that I shall be your guide? Are you expert in such things as harbors? Hmm. Very expert, Herr Nightingale. And who would dare to resist? Felicitas! And who would dare to refuse such a delightful invitation? Tomorrow, then? <coughs> no. Tonight. I'm more composed after supper. Excuse me. Do you know, I think I could consume another fish. Yes, I really think I could. I'm as fighting Sholly! Thank you, sir. You walk along this way for an hour, Herr Nightingale. You will come to... Yes? Uh, to where the fishermen live. The men who bring Mama her fish. <coughs> there has not always been a wall here, Herr Nightingale. Before the fire, there were little cottages here. I remember. Before the fire? 
But how could you possibly remember? You were too young. No, the Great Fire was uh, 18 years ago. But I do remember. It is locked in my memory. It is my first memory. The fire. Was it dreadful? <laughs> dreadful? Oh, it was wonderful. Wonderful. I was so little. I was curled up in my father's strong arms, and he held me so close. And we watched the flames leaping all along the roofs of the little cottages, higher and higher, swallowing everything. And my father holding me so close, so tight, and shading my eyes with his big hand. But I could see between his fingers, see everything. The flames. Yes. Oh, how I wish. What? I want to see them again. I want them to come again. Just for me. Flames. Raging fires. There, look. Look. Those tall masts. Such an old and decrepit freighter. Useless and old. Older even than you. How the masts would crackle and burn. Like a ship in a bottle? Yes, like a ship in a bottle. The bottle in my room? Yes, that one in your room. Oh, we could watch them together. Burst into flames, burn all night. Burn? There was nothing but ashes. Burning and blazing. Oh, I want it too. I want it too. Today, you promised to reveal it to me, the ultimate truth. Then I shall have conquered eternity. Oh my God, no. The hour, the minute, the second, when death will strike them down. The old fools, Hester Quebec, the cheat, those poor deluded women, what? Children? I have no children. I never shall have children. Oh, you will have one. Uh, who are you? The mother of your unborn child, my love. Black seagulls. Black seagulls. Black seagulls. Black seagulls. 
Excellent, Mama. Oh, thank you. Thank yes. You. Far more tasty than my own omelettes. And more nutritious, too. The art of making omelettes is very simple. Uh, my own dear mother... It is mother. not an omelette. It is not? It is not an omelette. What did he say? He says it is not an omelette, Mama. It is a pancake. A stuffed pancake. Oh, but her nightmare. Oh, you look it up. Felicitas, fetch the cookery book, please. It is not important, surely. It is only an omelette. It is not an omelette. It is a pancake. And an overcooked pancake at that. There. Me, let me. Here, now. Omelets. There. Prepare and whip six eggs, six spoonfuls of cream and six spoonfuls of flour. There, you see, you lie. Flour, indeed. It never could be an omelette. Please, listen. In another saucepan, boil together some skimmed sweet bread and add together with diced shallot and onion a free... <laughs> it is a pancake. There is going to be a storm. A, a very bad storm, young Nightingale. Like it was on the night of the fire. I recall it as though it were yesterday. All the old houses collapsed. They are not agreeable memories. Not agreeable? Or the fire? Or the stuffed pancake, which you were pleased to call an omelette when you were delicious, deceitful people? Oh. The approach of death, perhaps. Is that more agreeable? Yes, why are you so afraid of it? Of death? It is no vice. It is not unspeakable. The Bible never ceases to speak of it. It is an adventure. It approaches. At any moment, it may strike. Oh, please, my dear friend. Yes, your dear friend. Margaret. And in my house, stop it, wanton. What? I cannot understand it. Why are they all so angry? Her nightingale. Yes, but surely you. You can understand, old woman. Can you not? What power it must give you if you can find the precise instant, that very moment, savor it, taste it, on the tip of the tongue, the moment of dying. No, no. make him cease. Sir hey, Nightingale, I really must insist in and the presence of... And I can. And shall. Go. Vouch safe to each one of you. The exact moment uh, of death. Oh, uh, no, 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 Have pity on us. So prepare yourselves. According to your religious practice, you have not long. Paradise. I have written them down. The dates. The hour when it will strike. When each one of you will be, without mercy, cut down. Yes, this is how I die. 
empty. All of it happened again to me. Now I'm frozen. The cold and burning center. <laughs> Her day. Her day. Murder. Murder. Dear Mr. Stakerbeck, even in the midst of the lamentable circumstances that have befallen your house, sir, it behoves me, as an English gentleman, to write to you not merely to thank you for the impeccable hospitality which you and your family vouchsafed to me during my all too brief visit to your charming city, but also to offer you my heartfelt condolences over your dreadful misfortunes. During those weeks, as your guest, I learned to admire your late daughter's vivaciousness and love for life, as well as the warm, generous character of poor, gentle Frau Lise, having grown so fond of them. I can appreciate what an appalling loss you must feel. First the death of dear little Felicitas, and then the total abandonment of reason by gentle Frau Lise after her miscarriage in that fearful sounding institution for the mad. Will that do? I think that will do, don't you? Should you ever imagine that I was in some small measure to blame for these tragic events, may I offer you my most humble and sincere apologies? For my part, I'm about to travel to the seaside in order to enjoy a much needed period of convalescence. Your loyal friend, Nightingale. Um, P.S. The directors of my father's company note with regret that our yellow conveyances will no longer be required by your Senate. As you see, gentlemen, now an old man <laughs> with few of the consolations of old age <laughs> to be elected. A member of your august establishment would mean much to a lonely old soul. Sir, you are, by your own despicable account, a damned murderer. I, sir? If anyone was to blame for the death of young Felicitas in the fire... You were responsible for that. And responsible for the destruction of your own unborn child. And the insanity of that poor, wretched widow that you seduced. I say, if anyone was to blame... It was him. Him? Oh, well, in that case, produce him, sir. Do you really mean to say that you cannot see him, gentlemen? Yeah. He stands by that candelabra. As young and strong as he was that first night when he proffered his magic powers to me. 
in that room in Hamburg. While I have, as you perceive, grown old and frail. <laughs> Mr. Nightingale. I regret to have to tell you that you have failed to satisfy us. Your story was bizarre, but patently untrue. This other person doesn't exist, never has existed. Oh, gentlemen, you must all be blind. Look there. He smiles. No. Oh, no, no, I swear it. Every word that I have said is true. Every word. This is not my day. I shall live for a long time. Thank you.